This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Nourished. Things in our world can feel so chaotic. We have so many things on our minds and it can be easy for the little things to slip, especially when it comes to getting our nutrients and vitamins. Thankfully, help is at hand. Nourished is the world's first truly personalised gummy vitamin. Each 3D printed vegan and sugar-free stack contains seven personalised layers of high-impact, scientifically backed vitamins and nutrients. They're made fresh to order and they're delivered straight to your door, so it's one less thing to think about. Search Get Nourished to take a short quiz and find out what nutrients you need. Use code VEGANLIFE50, numeric 50, to get 50% off your first order. Anton Petrov is, he's a regular on the show. Uh, he's done high-end stuff, he's done cheese, he's done French cuisine and seasonal cooking. Uh, he runs classes, demos, private dinners, uh, but more pertinently, foraging expeditions. He's developed oh, master classes yes. at Demuth Cookery School, Harborn Food School and Made in Hackney. Also here, it's Mitch McCulloch. He's a returning guest from our Grow Your Own episode. He's a regenerative and organic no-dig grower. He's also been working on a solution-focused chat show, which aims to inspire others to make positive changes in their own lives, while at the same time, try and help ease climate anxiety. I've got to say, uh, I worry less about my recycling uh, since I discovered there's going to be a third world war. Anyway, uh, you can find him on YouTube under the under Mitch Grows Show. Anyway, gents, welcome back. It's lovely to have you here. Great pleasure to be here. Hi, now, Jake. Hi, before Mitch. We, before we kick off on this whole uh, foraging thing, and I'm very excited about this, am I right in understanding... I, I'm not going to disclose any details. But is there such a thing as the the foraging police? Is that a thing, Mitch? Um, I, there's definitely certain places you can't forage. Um, Waitrose, I find, take a very dim view of it. <laughs> um, like Epping Forest, for instance, that's like kind of like where I used to, uh, close to where I used to live, and, and there's lots of signs up saying you can't forage there, and also where I am in the New Forest, there's sort of no laws on, for, uh, no, no fungi, uh, fungi picking rules there. Also, if you're next to a triple SI, you can't really be going picking in triple SIs. But there's um there's funny sort of laws with foraging. Like it should be our right to be able to go and gather food. Um but yeah, the, the laws are quite funny, especially with private land and things. Sure. Anton, is this about great answer. Great is answer, it about Mitch. Doing it like you can't do it for sort of commercial purposes, is that right? You you can't. You can't do it for commercial purposes purposes unless you uh, reach out to private land owners uh -huh. um, and you uh, communicate directly with them. I know a lot of uh, professional foragers, like the one of the greatest ones, I think, is John from Forage London. Uh, 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 Ranston, I I may chop his surnames, uh, so but uh, you can you can find him of, on Forage London and beyond on Facebook and Instagram. He's incredible. He can tell a lot of stories uh, okay. about the laws, and I visited his um, walk, and basically it was in a new forest, oh. and uh, we were harvesting, and he was charging money for it, but. But then like you once the you have the oh. agreement with the new forest commissionary, um, when it, it it should be legitimate, basically. Um, sure. If you speak with landowners, that's the easiest way to. M most of the time, people never mind. They just they don't mind. They, but it's it's good to respect other people's private lands. And sure. if you do, that's that's all you pretty you need pretty much. Okay. But I loved Mitch's answer. I think he has uh, a very good and thorough. Uh, answer and then uh, I loved his answer too, and I, I loved his hat. I loved everything. It was it all worked. It was beautiful. Yeah, super um, stylish, truly. Okay, now we've got the sort of that the, the caveats are out of the way. Now we can actually just pile in and enjoy it. And perhaps we should start with this. this is a great question from I think it's Eshti, uh, who says, "Where are good places in Britain to forage?" Okay, so well, where where would you go, Anton? Well. <clears throat> I uh, I have most of my experience is actually in south of England, um, and it's uh, 
say the line that goes through the London um, and all the way to Bristol and uh, to your South End, mm-hmm. all that part of the country plus the South. Um, I must say that uh, UK is mesmerizingly beautiful and um, abundant uh, land or soil, whichever you want to call it. Uh, anywhere you go, 365 days a year, you can find an abundant set of wild edibles. And I'm only talking about plants, flowers, nuts, mushrooms, seaweeds, sea vegetables. It's all around. And if you go north, um, I don't feel like there's going to be a very big difference. Maybe if it's like very, very north in Scotland, some of the items uh, may differ. Um, Some may be more abundant, like girols and mushrooms and some less. But UK is foraging. The wild food is all around. Amazing. That's my answer. Thank you. Mitch. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, Everywhere across the UK is brilliant to forage and not just sort of the countryside. Urban areas can be a great place to find wild foods, Um, especially London. Um, That's Mm. where I grew up and I have a lot of spots there. Uh, Like lots of fruit trees grow in London. So you can just like walk around and and you'll see lots of fruit trees growing. Maybe they're on someone's uh, in someone's front garden. Just go and ask them for some if you can go and harvest and they're more than likely going to say yes. Um, and because London, or just cities in general, they kind of have their own micro microclimate, so a little bit warmer, so you can get things like figs, fruit in there, and yeah. So don't just uh, necessarily go jump in, in your car or on the train to your nearest green space. Like you can, if you live in a city, that there's also places you can forage there. But look out for places that have been sprayed, or if plant looks sick, obviously don't go near it. So there's obviously a few protocols to follow. I was going to say that, like, you know, do you guys try to avoid foraging close to roads? Like, do you Mm -hmm. worry about emissions and, I don't know, not lead, but particulates and stuff like that? Mitch? Um, I mean, I wouldn't go and forage next to a dual carriageway or a motorway, but like sort of country lanes and stuff, I'm not that bothered. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you can stay away from busy roads, that's, that's a good shout. Yeah. I'm guessing a a thorough wash is probably the way forward. Um, but that just applies to me really. Right. Fran says, what are some good coastal plants that I can cook with, please? Uh, I live on the Kent coastline and I notice so many different varieties, but I wouldn't know where to start with what is edible or not. I really love this question. I I think I tried sea kale for the first time last year. It was wildly exciting. Mm. Um, uh, Mitch, let's start with you. Well, yeah, like you said, like cranberry sea, cranberry sea kale is a really good, good, um, forageable plant on on the coast. It's really easy to identify. Um, Then, so just coming out of season now, but you've got Alexanders. They're in the um, the carrot family. There is like poisonous, um, highly poisonous members of that family, but they, okay. they're quite easy to identify. <laughs> they, they flower yellow and they have like a waxy leaf. So yeah, they're pretty easy to identify. And then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, where do you want to start? You've got sea beets, you've got lettuce, um, sea lettuce, you've got pepper dulse, which is a seaweed, which takes a, tastes a little bit like truffle. It's like a pretty much like a delicacy. And then there's the whole world of going down the whole shellfish route and, and that sort of stuff. Sure. That's if you're a, a Peter Singer model vegan. Uh, Anton, uh, what about you? Um, so, uh, Kent, um, Leon C for me was uh, uh, my uh, most uh, beloved uh, spots uh, living uh, next to London. Uh, so it's same region, it's same climate, uh, same sort of plants. Um, the salt marsh area is your go-to. If you have it near you, then you can pretty much forage wild greens throughout the year. Uh, in the winter, late November till uh, February, March, you would harvest 
actually that's the best time to forage a wild spinach or, or sea beets, as they call it. They have this slightly salty, spinachy flavor profile. Um, and during those winter months, it's actually when it's most succulent, salty, uh, like very beautiful crunch, um, j just a luscious, luscious wild veg that's just abundant uh, throughout uh, the coast. Um, that's basically winter. And then also super slain is uh, available throughout the year. Is again another naturally salty um, sea vegetable, <clears throat> sea green. Then we've got fennel, alexanders, as Mitch mentioned. Again, I think alexanders are the best season for them is in the winter because that's what they have this kind of celery ish. Uh, parsley-ish flavor profile uh, with a bit of sweetness and towards the end of their season it kind of becomes very very bitter but uh, what's super exciting about alexanders is that not only they're luscious and juicy uh, they somewhere i guess it's towards march april they start giving out this very very thick shoot that is the blossoming um, body but it can grow into this kind of beautiful bulb uh, before the the the, the pollen uh, part uh, is exposed and so entire of this part is the the best heart of of the plant itself so if you harvest that one you can just cook it with a little bit of butter a little bit of cider and then finish it um, just with freshly chopped um, alexander leaves and it's a killer if uh, it's obviously it's not a very uh, vegan thing but going with the seafood with shellfish it's it's one of the best things but you can serve it if you're a vegan with potatoes again great thing as you yeah. can see, Jake, I can talk for hours sure. and I haven't even started. So you have to control me here. I, I will um, control you. I have my taser and it's but if you if you if I basically there is just if I will sum it up, uh, it's tons of different plants. And between May and July, you have the king of British sea vegetables, uh, especially in Kent and in Lyon Sea, which is the Sunfire and the Sea Aster. It's the juiciest, the most incredible plant. And I must tell you, in UK, in Lyon Sea and in Kent, these plants, uh, the Sunfire in particular, it's the greatest quality on earth no doubt no joke it's it's just by june july it develops this very thick body and it's almost like you're eating seawater but it's the most delicious filled with iodine you 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 need to just slightly saute it with garlic fresh parsley lemon juice and pepper give it a little bit of olive oil don't need to fry it too much just saute it lightly and that's it. Finish it with lemon juice. You'll speak to God. You'll have religious experience by by eating that fire, some fire on on its own. And I'm not exaggerating. That's how good it is. So <laughs> I think I'm, I'm going to say you're, I'm going to say you're slightly exaggerating, very slightly exaggerating. Uh, you know, haven't. I listen. What you're if you I listen, cooked it for you, if I cooked it for you, twitching over the table. If I cooked it for you, you'd have amazing. Uh, <laughs> not only a religious but also other um, experiences because that sunfire is that uh, good i'm done i'm pushing 50. kathleen says what can i do with my wild strawberries in my garden uh, i've tried them and they're incredibly sharp and quite bitter it was an unpleasant flavor but quite strong to eat on their own are you are you waiting till they turn red, Kathleen? Anyway, she says any recommendations. <laughs> that was my question too. I'm sorry. Um, i mean they should be quite, quite a deep red obviously um uh mitch I mean, to be honest with you, I think wild strawberries are delicious as they yeah. are. Um, but if, if, yeah, if they aren't ripe, then I guess, or well, if they are ripe and they're still bitter, then you could maybe try macerating them with a little bit of sugar. I like to put a little bit of salt and black pepper in with the maceration. Mm. 
Um, it's just going to bring out the flavors. Mm-hmm. Um, Great idea. From, yeah, I mean, yeah, unless you're going to add sugar, I don't really know what yeah. you what you want what you want to achieve. I guess a, a jam, maybe some sort of preserve. Yeah. Anton. Well, there's not enough to make a jam to begin with. The, you, the, the, you, it would the, take a thousand years, wouldn't it, to make? Yeah. Yes. Um, no. Again, I agree with Mitch. If if it's still if it's red and it still doesn't taste good, then something is wrong, and I would actually well try to maybe change something, like give it some fertilizers natural ones yeah. maybe mitch knows uh, well better than me for sure um but if it's ripe it's one of the most incredible things in life it's just it's little explosions of flavor um uh, it's delicate it's yeah. sour and sweet and actually in, from in my childhood the best thing you could do is combine fresh wild strawberries with uh, the blueberries a little bit of sweetened milk and have it like a cornflakes but instead of cornflakes you have your berries nice. again incredible experience uh, but i'm not going to mention the religion uh, Kathleen anymore. i want to ask how prickly are the leaves is it actually a holly bush i'm just asking <laughs> This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Nourished. One of the hardest things about living a busy life is trying to remember all the tiny details like where did I leave my car keys? Did I already add salt to this recipe or do I still need to do it? Did I just take all my vitamins today or did I just dream that I did? It can all get a bit stressful, can't it? But it doesn't have to be. Nourished is the world's first personalised gummy vitamin stacked with vitamins and minerals to suit your health and lifestyle goals. I'm supposed to have goals? Oh no. Each 3D printed, 100% vegan and sugar-free vitamin stack contains seven layers of high-impact, scientifically backed nourishments. It's made to order and it's delivered straight to your door. And if that isn't enough, you get Saving the Planet bragging rights too, as all of Nourished's packaging is 100% plastic-free and compostable. Get your personalised recommendation by searching Get Nourished to take a short quiz. And use code VEGANLIFE50, VEGANLIFE50, to get 50% off your first order. Josh says, are there easy ways to help spot poisonous plants? Anton, is there like a rule of thumb? Is red the bad colour? Bad Mm -mm, colour? No? mm -mm, mm -mm. Absolutely no. Um, um, I I have no idea. There's no generalisation. I think, um, like... For example, Mitch mentioned the Alexanders, and it's true. Um, Alexanders grow sometimes in a kind of, you can find them in a similar environments. They're not just coastal plants. You can find them actually in London, in most of London's parks, there they grows beautiful, beautiful Alexanders. Um, and usually there is, um, so the carrot and fennel family is like so extensive. But there are a few plants, and one of them is the worst of them all. It's called uh, deadlock, hemlock water drop, dropwort. Yeah. Okay. Am I saying it correct, Mitch? Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah, I think um, we need to be suppressing So one, that, one, that one, that yeah. one, uh, that one has a specific stem that you can always tell apart. It has this kind of reddish dots all over it, and they're quite intense. It's not pure red. Um, kind of red purple esque kind of color um and it's uh, it's uh, that that one is uh, is is kind of the good sign to to differentiate but in reality if i were to uh give a, re- a recommendation that is really worthy the only way to do it ladies and gentlemen is uh, is actually a higher forager to explain you the differences, to, to take you out and show you the few different varieties of those plants, Alexander's, wild parsley, um, hemlock water dropwort. There, there are other u- uh, umbilicals, the ones that have the kind of umbrella pollen. Um, there are quite a few varieties of them. Not many of them are super toxic. And uh, hemlock is actually really easy. Once you learn it, once you research it, 
and you really s learn about telling those specific signs every vegetable has their own specific color there are ways to tell them apart the mushrooms the plants all of them but you really need to have a a field guide uh, a book to make sure that you really double check yourself for example very quick story how once uh, um, a lady told me a story that she uh, uh, went with her friend to a park and like oh uh, this is wild garlic and so um, she showed it to uh, lords and ladies, uh, which is another plant, which can look similar, especially at uh, uh, kind of earlier parts of uh, vegetation, um, of growth. And uh, uh, basically she showed it to that and lords and ladies, they are not, it's not the most terrible of plants. It's not going to kill you, but it will scare the living hell out of you. And it, before I learned it, I bit into it three times, three years in a row, because like that was my learning experience. Um, ah. I had to, I, I had to sometimes taste a tiny bit and spit it out. Never swallow. Um, to to if you're not sure. Uh, never swallow anything, um, well, but never swallow uh, biting anything. into that leaf, it gives you the impression that you just uh, had chewed on a glass fiber. It, it's like it's it's not just okay. tingling. It can get really intense and okay. have this kind of strong reaction, which can be scary. So that lady started Thanks. eating on it as it was as if it was wild yeah. garlic. And had to go to hospital just because she is, well, she was very very scared. Sure. Um, but it was fine. I mean, so I, I, I try to have. Fiber. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll yeah, just finish on. it very quickly. Go on. Try to have a book. Always have a field guide with uh, pictures. You can always have a Google. You have a smartphone. There are apps. Some of them are pretty useless. So the best way is to have a book and hire a for and go for a for a walk with a local forager there are plenty of them all around uk um that's right. the way mitch uh anything to add yeah not really i mean just make sure you've got multiple positive identification sources mm -hmm. before, you've, before you even enjoy and mm -hmm. yeah if you're ever in doubt throw it out if, yeah good call very good call. good call um, very good call that's sort of conflated liam's question uh, which was can i have some tips on how to forage or some good websites for starting out i would say we were talking about apps um a bit of a game-changing app for me because I, I don't know anything about plants uh there's an app called picture this and the icon of it because there's probably like six hundred thousand apps called picture this but it's it's white and it's got like a, a green silhouette of a sort of flower in a kind of shutter frame picture this and um i ended up paying it something like 20 quid i think for the year but it's really good you can take a photo of any plant and it i will identify it for you um and if it has trouble with it i think it actually sends the picture off to an actual human who will then look at it for you so um it's pretty good i'm not affiliated with them and i accept no liability if you get poisoned <laughs> but it's not a bad uh it's not a bad one to try um, Can I add one last thing, please? Yeah. Um, there are lots of Facebook groups that uh, are very, very quick to respond. So you can just upload your picture and within a few seconds, sometimes you, you get an answer. They are quite uh, popular these days. Uh, just find um, some groups, search for foraging identification. Uh, there is wild food. Uh, and hedge witchery, something like that. It w it's one of the most popular groups on Facebook. And uh, yeah, those are very, very fast to, to respond and can help you if That's you don't call. have a book with you. That's a very good call. Uh, Izzy and Mark say, we recently ate at Wilder Allotment Kitchen on our holidays in Truro. Totally recommend it. The atmosphere is fantastic and the people who work there are great. The food they use comes from locally sourced organic allotments. My question is, do the guests recommend any eateries, cafes or restaurants? I always think these vegan places succeed on word of mouth. That's a great question. Mitch, where do you like to go? To be honest, I... 
since I've moved, I haven't really been eating out too much. Um, I think, I think I can I can recommend somewhere in London uh, that 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 um, isn't necessarily vegan, but they do sell lots of um, vegan food. It's called Silo. Um, mm, mm, so great. They're, yeah, it's it's all about sort of zero waste and um, sustainability and using produce which isn't necessarily yeah so so there's zero waste there so check out silo very very cool anton great call mitch Uh, and i know for sure silo offers vegan menus and they're just mind-blowing there you it's hundred it's worth all every penny to go there uh i it's one of the best restaurants for sure um um as for me you know i was supplying quite a few restaurants in london there were a lot of them um uh not so many vegan restaurants to be honest with you so uh, if if um if i were to recommend london restaurants pretty much all decent restaurants that have a Michelin label, uh, not the star, not necessarily the star, but just the label of the Michelin, uh, the sticker on their door, most likely will source some form of local wild uh, harvested produce. But um, to name a few, um, Premier Western uh, Westerns laundry uh, are incredible. They're not super vegan. Uh, or Jolene's Bakery. It's all around um, uh, New England Green area in East London. Um, it's just a fabulous. They're all owned by the same person, and they heavily rely on the, uh, wild ingredients. Clove Club, the two Michelin star uh, from East London. If you are super fancy, they are crazy about about wild foods and local ingredients. Um, they have vegan options as well. It's uh, it's a culinary experience uh, to go there and and try their food. Um, outside of London, uh, obviously, uh, I preach uh, I preach uh, for oak from Bath. Uh, the most important uh, plant-based restaurant in uh, in UK, in my opinion, um, uh, and uh, they are f- just received their green Michelin star. By the way, congratulations to Rich, um, and uh, they heavily rely on wild local ingredients. They have their own allotment. The restaurant in Bristol, Bull Rush. Uh, is an incredible place that uh, George uh, he is he is a fantastic chef and the food that they do there is again one one that he inspired me and blew my brains a lot and I used to supply him nice. throughout the year so he nice. heavily relies on wild foods that's wow. that's well, so far we've blown our brains out and had conversations with God, so it's it's been quite quite a conversation. <laughs> it's every time when uh, I speak about food, it's it's that language. Sorry, sure. uh, Shian or Shian says, "What? I'm sorry. I, uh, what plants are coming into season that I can forage for, Mitch?" Plants. Um, I mean, for me, um, at the minute, it's really exciting mushrooms that are coming into season. Um, so you've got chicken in the woods, which is starting now. St George's actually. It should have started maybe a month ago, but we've had... Oh, there he goes. He's got some. Anton is fondling his chicken of the woods right now. Amazing. That looks beautiful. Now um, I know. Yeah, so St. George's, um, they, they should have been around maybe about two to three, four weeks ago, but we've had no rain, so those guys are starting to flush now. Mm. Um, plant-wise, I've been collecting wood sorrel, cleavers, stinging nettles are a good time to collect them now before they start flowering. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, it's just, this is like a really good time for collecting plants. Um, there's so many good spring edibles out there. Nice. Anton, anything to add to that? Oh, plenty. Plenty, plenty, plenty. Uh, yes, so as you can see, I've got this really gorgeous chicken Chicken of the woods Mm -hmm. uh it unfortunately it's past its prime um it it's one of those tricky mushrooms that uh goes past its prime very fast so it when you catch it super super young moist it's one of the most delicious uh mushrooms out there you need to cook it just garlic and butter 
salt, it's heavenly. Um, but it can go dry really, really fast, um, and well, then it's uh, inedible. Yeah, yeah. When it, then it's inedible. But after that, it's uh, everything that starts into flower, uh, cherry blossoms, elderflowers, uh, wild garlic, wild garlic flowers, um, wild what nettles, would you do with, fennel. What would you do with cherry blossoms? Oh, cherry blossoms. So th you can make an infusion. You can dry them um, and then add them to your herbal uh, tea infusions. You can make an alcohol infusion. And uh, some people even make the jam out of it. I never tried, um, um, uh, but yeah, it's it's an incredible, incredible condiment uh, in in many ways that you can utilize it. Amazing. Uh, plenty of things to harvest, uh, both in uh, in fields, in uh, little parks and uh in salt marshes it's it's the area to go and also great season for seaweed in devon and in dorset area um that's that's nice. what's available now beautiful sophie says ever since i watched the netflix mushroom documentary uh and you well you should listen to our mushroom special because we had uh thingy off of that i can never remember names i'm sorry i suck uh, i have had such a fascination for them where are good spots in the uk for mushroom foraging anton well uh the king of them all i think is uh, new forest and epping but both of those are special scientific interest sites uh, meaning that uh, you're not allowed to harvest mushrooms there you're supposed to only look at them um but sniff them. in reality, sniff them. in reality, yeah. I, I think those laws are not the best ones. I understand why they are there because London and like uh, it's those are very highly populated areas. So you need to protect them from being over harvested. But mm -hmm. if you are very careful, um, foraging can be very, very good for the environment. You can spread the spores. You can allow the mushrooms to proliferate around the woods. That's kind of the mushroom is a fruiting body that is supposed to spread the spores. So the mycelium, the web that is in the in the forest floor can actually, that's the most important living body, can spread around um, and continue thriving and supporting the complex complex ecosystem so forests all the forests uh, marshes i would pick uh, chicken of the woods and uh, st george's mushrooms in uh, uh, around hackney marsh area but i'm not going to tell you my spots obviously but not. um if you are if you are resilient enough just go into the woods uh, the mushroom season actually goes throughout the year. It's just very hard to tell when to harvest and what to harvest. That's why the, the uh, good mushroom books, River Cottage series of foraging books are my Bibles. That's what I started with. That's what I taught myself with. No one taught me. I just self-taught through shout out to john irvin the uh -huh. author of all of these amazing books the, the legend the yeah. living legend who inspired the generation of british uh, foragers yeah. um, i'm sure no use um, of your legs anymore but still here excellent thank you sorry good um i think i threw you there sorry anton uh mitch yeah, it's all good. where would you go i think um before you, you go out in it, certain areas looking for certain places i think learning your trees would be a better start like if mm. you know what trees and know what habitat then you can start looking for mushrooms there's no point of going out for something that you don't know what you're going to look for so yeah learn the association trees and then go out in particular pursuit of that habitat nice idea get to know where you are rather than going out specifically to a place for a thing yeah nice i like that uh, final question, because um, uh, you, you mentioned nettles, Mitch. Andy says, uh, what can I cook using nettles and what are the flavors like? I've heard anything but salad, uh, but let's expand on that. Anton. 
Well, the, the simplest and quickest is just a velouté, uh, a delicious soup of uh, saute your garlic, leek, onions, and mm, add some potatoes, uh, add some bouillon, uh, if you don't have vegetable stocks uh, stock uh, and cook it cook until it's all of it is ready and only at the end chop some uh, nettles add them cook them for just about a minute turn the heat off allow it to cool down and blend it with some salt and extra olive oil maybe add a little bit of whole grain mustard if you want or black pepper that's it. It's it's delicious. It's fresh. I find that nettle uh, has um, it has a very subtle uh, aromatics. It's very pleasant. I really really like it a lot. I wouldn't have it for a salad um, <laughs> for sure. But a puree a puree um, is really really delicious. Some people cook it. Um, you know, there is actually in Greece, they, there is this very famous uh, mountain vegetable that tastes almost exactly like, I think it's called horta or something. Um, it kind of has this hairy, uh, slightly hairy um, uh, texture. Mm. But when you steam it and you serve it with olive oil and salt, it's simple and delicious and you can serve the nettles just uh, uh, as as well and grind some pepper bread delicious really really delicious on its own and um, the only thing i would add is that um, when you collect the nettles try to wear gloves because uh, during the spring Top is uh, during their uh during their uh kind of for growth season they are particularly uh, uh, sting, uh, stingy yeah. um, and it can burn it can burn and uh, what I suggest is put them in a plastic bag and then um, slightly wrap the leaves uh, so basically it's the a tiny little needles yeah they will be destroyed and, and then it's much much less uh, difficult to, to handle that's that's, top, that's from me. That's a top tip. I mean, we spend all this time waxing lemons. Why aren't we waxing nettle leaves? Uh, you want them smooth. Mitch, uh, what do you do with nettles? Actually, you know, you can scrunch up the little leaves into a little ball and you can eat them raw. Uh, it's quite a good little... You go first. Origes. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> um, I'm sure he does it a lot. Um, yeah, Anton was mentioning a puree there. I think you could use the puree in like a in like a gnocchi base and make some some mm. lovely nettle gnocchi, and then use some other wild ingredients to make a pesto to go along with that. Um, or treat them a little bit like spinach, sauté them with some garlic. Um, yeah, I just would treat them like like spinach. That's my best bet. That's a top tip. Well, um, thank you both so, so much. I do find uh, foraging is such an exciting idea. That I, I've done so little of it, but the little brief moments I've had have been such a rush. Um, where can people find more about you and your stuff? Mitch, let's start with you. Uh, I'm on Instagram, which is at Mitch underscore grows and the same on YouTube. Um, yeah, and then just that's, that's where you can find me. Perfect. And Anton? Instagram as well, Chef Anton Petrov, or you can reach me through the website if you have any inquiries for private dinners or walks or anything food related. Nice. Sounds good. Go foraging. Um, guys, thank you so much. And um, we, we, we will see you next time. Uh, that's it for this week's Vegan Life podcast. Uh, don't forget, uh, Vegan Life Live is, is happening. I, I can't remember when. I don't know, it's June. It's something. 14, 15, something like that. And I'll be there somewhere, probably chaotically going, oh, it, it, yes, like that. We're going to be doing a live edition of the podcast. And it would be so lovely if you came down to say hello. Um, yeah, I think otherwise, Jack Patch is going to talk there. There you go. Yeah. Everyone's, simply everyone's going to be there. Anton, are you going to be there? <laughs> no. It's so shame no. I can't make it. Almost everyone is going to be there. Um, don't forget, you can always send uh, us a question about any kind of vegan cookery. It's uh, podcast at veganlifemag.com. Don't forget, veganlifemag.com is where you can subscribe to the podcast. But in the meantime, from me, Jake Yap, take care of yourself, go out foraging, but do be careful. And bye! Bye!